Welcome to Design Your Destiny, your podcast for tapping into the power of your subconscious mind. In this next few minutes, allow me to show you how to tap into that power so that you can create success with ease, form deeper connections, and have greater presence in your relationships, and most importantly, find peace within yourself. My name is Penny Chason, and I'm your host. Okay, everyone, I am back with Sarah for part two of this episode. Sarah is a school psychologist and she is a coach for blended families. And I absolutely love this because so much of America's families are blended families in this day and age. And I was a part of more than one blended family and a parent of a blended family. So I totally get the struggles. She's been a step parent for 14 years, a coach for three, and she loves to work with families and children to help them decrease their anxiety and learn to communicate their needs more effectively. Sarah, thank you for coming on. And I would love for you to give just a little bit more background about who you are and what it is that you do. Thank you so much, Penny. I'm so happy to be here. I have been a school psychologist. This will be my 11th year. And we've noticed in the last kind of as time has gone by that anxiety for kids is steadily increasing. And so this is a passion of mine to be able to help give kids and family strategies to decrease their anxiety and to bring it down. I have two stepdaughters, 18 and 20, and I have learned so much from them and from being in a blended family. And I just wanted to share all the mistakes that I've made and help people because there are predictable things that we do in blended families at predictable times. And if we can avoid those, it helps a lot. So um, I grew up in Oregon. I love a lot of things about Utah and it's just great. Thanks for having me, Penny. You're absolutely welcome. I'm excited for this. So one of the things that I mentioned in the intro to uh, this episode is how this pandemic has been really a perfect storm because especially younger kids, they depend upon predictability to have that sense of safety and security. It's just a purely biological phenomenon that happens. And for some children, going to school is the only way to get some of that predictability into their life because parents are, you know, they're out there trying to hold things together for some people. I mean, we all come from a different place. We all have a different socioeconomic place that we come from. So it's it's very much different. And I've noticed some of the news that's come out of places like Australia, the UK, and even there have been news reports here and there here in the US uh, of children who have committed suicide, attempted to commit suicide, and that the mental health crisis is worse than the actual infection in these age groups. So I would like to just briefly start off with teens because my previous guest, that's what we were talking about. In terms of psychosocial needs, support that you can provide to a teen aside from allowing them to be who they need to be, what should parents be looking for? What resources are out there? So from the history of the research that psychology has done, there are two things that work really well for anxiety, and that's counseling and medication. A lot of parents are resistant to putting their kids on medication, though, um, which is okay, because there are a lot of things that you can do as a parent to help. So one of the websites, um, it's a little bit research heavy, but it's called Castle, C as in Charlie, A, S as in Sam, E as in egg, L. And it has different social and emotional learning skills curricula on there. Um, One of the favorite ones that I like to use that parents can use with their kids is called Strong Kids. And you can find that on Amazon. They have a preschool version, a grade school version, a teenage version. And then um, I'm just a huge fan of Amazon in general for their workbooks. They have one called the Anxiety Workbook for Teens. And I use that a lot in my practice with kids. So like you talked about in terms of strategies, prevention and intervention are huge. Right now we're in the middle of the crisis and so we have to do all intervention, Um, but there are daily prevention strategies that kids and adults can do to help decrease their anxiety. 
and depression. And those are things like um, sleep and exercise and getting enough sunlight, having fun, interaction and eating well. And so those are specific things that from the research um, we've come up with that can help kids. One of the school psychologists in my district actually came up with that selfie acronym, (laughs) the sleep, exercise, light, fun, interaction, and eating well, because it's easy to remember and it's easy for kids to do. And so they can do that and try to see how many of the things they can combine. So whether it's um, eating well with friends while they're having fun or um, just talking to people and kind of being outside and being around, having that interaction is huge for teenagers. I love that you brought that up because when I wrote my book around fibromyalgia, one of the things that I was seeing in the research, and I love that people are digging into this now, that 20 minutes of being outside every day significantly improved depression and anxiety scores in people with chronic illness, Mm -hmm. just getting outside. And I, I think that's a great point because kids now, and even some adults I speak with, they're addicted to their cell phones. They stay inside. And that's a whole other episode in and of itself as to how that impacts people. But I love that you bring that up to get outside, to get moving, the sunshine. And we definitely want to put the link to some of those resources in the show notes. So we will be sure that that is there for you um, to be able to click over to Amazon and also to take a look at that website if you're more into the research-minded stuff. Now, you tend to work with tweens, more or less, mostly, correct? I'm the 12 to 15 age group in middle school. Yeah. Yeah, So what are you seeing most commonly in that age group? Uh, What are some of the subtle signs that someone's adolescent might be meeting challenges, but maybe they don't recognize it within themselves or they're not comfortable reaching out. Yeah. I think as adults, that's where we can have a lot of power because my age group isn't really good at, I call it (laughs) self-reflecting and reporting back to their parents or to anybody besides their friends, what's happening. So to me as adults, our responsibility is to have conversations with them to initiate those things, to notice, hey, I notice you've been spending more time in your room lately. Um, Spending time in your room is totally normal for teenagers, but you've been spending more time in your room. Or maybe um, your eating or sleeping habits have changed. Maybe you're not doing as much as you have done in the past. And it's a little bit hard to tease that out with the pandemic, which is why I say have those conversations. Ask your kids how they're doing. Let them know that you care especially with the older age group that I'm in, kind of telling them, hey, I'm working on this thing and would you like to work on it with me is really helpful because then they don't feel targeted like you're saying, you're not doing a good job with your life. Um, They feel like, okay, there's something that I can do to have help. So with my kiddos, um, honestly, I just assume that most of them have some level of anxiety and most of them do. And it shows up differently. Some of them, it looks like defiance, like they're not willing to do things and they refuse to work. Some of them, it looks like breaking down in class. Some of them just shut down. It depends on the kid, but I just assume that most kids have some levels of anxiety and that has worked well for my population. (laughs) One of the specific questions that I was asked was, You know, after having not been in class, there's a lot of resistance to going back into class. Now, my children are grown, but knowing how news media is, concerns of family, witnessing just the life stressors that kids really shouldn't have to put up with in an ideal situation, my mind goes to a lot of places you know, are they fearful of going back to school because of what they've seen and heard? Or is it just not wanting to go back to that routine? Or maybe they weren't supported in class in a way that met their needs and and they found a way to do that at home. I, I would just love to get your ideas, your observations, and how do you work with a child to get them to be open to returning to class? What are some strategies? 
I'm really grateful I'm not a parent of school age children right now. We're just going to leave this right here. This is why I have the experts on because <laughs> I have no frame of reference at this point to uh, to work with this. Yeah, that makes sense. And personally, I don't with my stepchildren either um, because my youngest, my oldest graduated two years ago and my youngest was doing online school um, due to a concussion. But Utah went back to school last year and the kids had to wear masks all but the last week of the school year. And what we saw for most of our kids was that they were thrilled to go back to school, (laughs) that they hated online learning. They hated if they had to go quarantine because we were contact tracing. Um, They hated if they had to quarantine and learn online because it was more difficult to learn online. They missed their friends and they just wanted to be in that social setting. And so um, for a lot of kids, I know there are a few kids I had that elected to stay online again for next year because they like it better. And I think that's an option in most states. Um, But in terms of preparing kids to go back, I think it's just reassuring them that their fears are normal, that um, you and the school and the district are going to do what they can to protect them from COVID and then making sure that they're safe and healthy And doing some of those things that we just talked about that help boost their immune systems, getting sunlight, taking vitamins, things like that, that can help them fight off anything that they did have can be really helpful. With little kids, bibliotherapy works really well. So there's not necessarily literature or books about going back to school after a pandemic, but there are a lot of things that kids can do and books you can read about anxieties and fears and unexpected things. And kids are super responsive to adult conversation, just saying like, hey, this is what anxiety feels like in your body. And where do you feel it? And what do you feel when it happens? And then what are some things that you're anxious about? Here are things that I'm anxious about. It makes us all nervous when we can't do this. So what are you scared about? And those conversations kids respond so well to because they know somebody's listening. They know somebody cares about them and they're not being talked down to. Um, they're being involved in the process, and that really helps. Right. And in my observations of just conversations, and and I I have to say, I really love this because all of the work I do is based around feelings and misperceptions that we place on these feelings as children. And what I've noticed is that there's more of a conversation of teaching kids to check in with their body. Mm -hmm. because kids don't know what anxiety is. They may not know that what they're feeling physically is fear. They may not even know it's anger unless they get to the point that they're melting down. Mm -hmm. What insights, what are some good questions to ask? I mean, how, how would you reassure parents that they've got this and how do they know when it's time to reach out to a professional. I think that's really important in this conversation. So, okay. So I'm going to answer your second question first. Um, When you, whenever you feel like you're worried about your kiddo, when you feel like they need help, when you feel like they need support, when you're struggling, I know there are school psychologists in almost every country in the world. There are social workers, there are licensed counselors and therapists that you may have on your health insurance that you can take your kids to. And even if they're not in a crisis, they'll always benefit from going to some kind of therapy, like a play therapy for younger kids or sand tray therapy to help them learn about their emotions and learn how to handle them in a way that helps them. Um, In terms of the emotions, you talked about the kind of misperceptions and things. One of the things I love about the strong kids curriculum is that they don't describe emotions as good or bad, positive or negative. They describe them as comfortable and uncomfortable. And so we can talk about emotions like anxiety. I have a lot of anxiety. (laughs) When I get anxious, my breathing gets faster. My shoulders tense up. My stomach feels like there are maybe like little butterflies or something happening in there. When I feel sad or when I start to feel kind of more like on the depression side of things, I get more irritable. So explaining those kinds of things to kids and just looking up the symptoms is so, it's so easy. It's so (laughs) Googleable, and there's no, you know, with our internet and everything we have, there's no reason to not say, Hey, like as a parent, I don't have to go get my graduate degree in social work or psychology. I can look this up. 
I can recognize that my kid's having a hard time and I can help them. Um, with younger kids, one of the things you want to look for is regression. So if they previously could, they were toilet trained, but they start wetting the bed again, or if they just kind of any area of developmental regression, whether it's like they want to be held more or stuff like that's a really good time to intervene with your kids and teach them strategies. Um, I'm a huge fan of the app Headspace for kids to teach them meditation. They have little one minute videos and then three to five minute meditation practices. But just being with your kids is, it's such a different experience this last year because we all work and we're away from our families so much of the time. But um, being around our kids, we notice so many more things that are happening with them. And it allows us to have those conversations and to say, you know, this is a little bit beyond my expertise. I've done this, this, and this, but it's not helping. So maybe I'll go get them into somebody. You've probably already realized that attempting to work through what is going on subconsciously yourself can be just a little bit of a challenge. And that's because when we try to assess what's going on subconsciously, using our conscious analytical mind, we go in circles sometimes. So I would like to offer you the opportunity to connect with me. No cost, no obligation. I will sit with you for 45 minutes. We will dig into what is going on in your life, and I will provide you with a subconscious blueprint so you know where it is most important that you target your time and your attention so that you can fully embrace your success in your personal and professional life. Because everyone should be not only successful, but able to be fully authentic in themselves while feeling fulfilled at the same time. You can book your call at pennychason.com forward slash blueprint. I look forward to seeing you on a call so I can help you reach your absolute most fulfilled success. So the work that I do at talking about feelings and emotions, uh, when I do hypnosis, one of the guides that I use with where we go in the process is based off of a book written by my mentor, Calvin Banyan, called The Secret Language of Feelings. And we most definitely, all feelings are good when they're based on accurate perception. And part of that is that through doing that check-in to make sure it's an accurate perception. If the feeling's not based on accurate perception through that process, we can acknowledge that and allow it to fall away. And it's still not a bad feeling. It's just what we do with it. So I think that being able to identify our feelings, being able to understand what it's telling us, so we can meet our needs. Our our feelings are like the gauges on the dash of a car. You know, we don't put oil in the car when the low fuel light comes on, right? And I, I really, really wish we had a version of this book for kids because it, it's an important conversation because when we don't acknowledge our feelings, when we stuff our feelings, then things can come to a crescendo. And that's when our kids melt down. And I think that not just, you mentioned headspace for kids, not just for kids, but for the parents to be mindful and aware of what's going on so that there can be a conversation or an intervention before things get to that point. I'm going to bring in something that's a little out of left field into the conversation for a moment, just because I think you may be able to tie this together with, and as an example, there's a a physician who is on the leading edge of what he calls healthcare 3.0. His brand is ZDogMD on Facebook, but he does interviews with leaders in healthcare. And last year, I believe it was even before the pandemic hit, He had an epidemiologist on his video podcast, and they were talking about vaccinations. And she was talking about how they've done this research in Canada 
I believe it was Canada. If I misspoke, my apologies. It's been a long time. But what they noted is that when children receive multiple vaccinations in a single visit, once you hit three vaccinations in one visit, a child's chances of developing a needle phobia later goes up exponentially. And it's because within the context of that moment, we basically worn down their coping mechanisms. Like they can, they can deal with the first vaccine. They can deal with the second one. By the time you're getting around to the third one, it's like, wait, stop. And the warning signs go up. So when I think about that, I think about the repetitive stressors of the pandemic. We're going to school. We're not going to school. You got to get tested. You're on quarantine. You're not on quarantine. I just, I have so much compassion for parents right now. I know I've said it before. So how can parents do a check-in to the best they can have the most stable environment for their kids? Because it's not predictable right now. Still. That's one of the things that I love to talk about with kids. And on the, there's a website called Teachers Pay Teachers that I get a lot of resources from. They have a a graphic of things you can control versus things you can't control. And so doing a blank version of that for kids can be really helpful. Um, I actually have some on my desk somewhere. I usually do. Um, So doing a blank version of that can be really helpful. We can't control whether we go back to school. We can't control when we go back to school. We can't control whether we wear masks. We can control um, how we feel. We can control what we choose to do. We can control how we act. We can control the clothes that we wear. We can control what we decide to eat for lunch. And so just helping kids to focus on what they can control and even adults to focus on what we can control versus can't control is really helpful. Um, I saw this year a lot of burnout with educators, parents, just everybody's kind of down to their last little bit. And um, self-love and self-care are such a buzzword, but they're so important, more important now than they've ever been. So involving your kids in your self-care and saying, this is something I need to do to take care of my emotions. This is something you can do to take care of. Yours can help as much as parents can model that is really helpful. And I know that can be hard because in my generation, we weren't taught social and emotional learning skills, but there's a lot available online and we'll all send Penny a lot of resources to put in the show notes. Yeah. And I I think that's so, so true. You know, I, I'm not sure of your age, but I, I know I grew up hearing, you know, kids are to be seen, not heard. If you got upset and I know this is probably going to excuse my French, piss somebody off. But I remember being told, put that lip back in your face where it belongs. You know, um, pretty is as pretty does. I know that's another one that some people find offensive, but I heard that growing up all the time. And it was that you always had to put on this face. I think there's even a country music song about put on your face, you know, when the world is going to, you know what? And while I think it's important that we do the self-care that we do what we can to make ourselves feel better. It's not about putting up this facade because this misperception that we get, and this goes to social media, the entire thing that happened with Simone Biles this last week. I mean, we put people on a pedestal and we look at other people and we think, wow, they have all their stuff together. And then we're judging ourselves on the inside And is that really something we want to model for our kids? I mean, while we don't want them walking around being emotional gushers, right? I was about to make up a word. We don't (laughs) want them gushing their emotions all the time, but we do want them to know it's okay to feel them. I'm just going to let you wrap it up and drive it home here. Just your big picture, if you could share anything you wanted to share with parents, Uh, If there's anything that you would recommend that they say to their kids that they do, your biggest takeaway as someone who works with kids in the, in the school system, coaches, parents, just, I'm going to let you wrap it up and then let people know where to find you. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Penny. So um, one thing I just want to touch on really quick, what you said is 
There is a culture of toxic positivity where everybody's like, it's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's going to be fine. And it's not. And it's okay for kids to say, I'm not okay right now. And kids need space to be able to do that. They need space to be able to express their emotions because it helps them to figure things out. Kind of my wrap up would be anxiety and depression are a huge problem in America right now. I don't know how it is in the rest of the world. I imagine that it will be with the pandemic too, but there are really so many resources, really simple things that we can do with our kids. We talked about finding a professional. I also am a huge believer in hypnosis, doing things to help remove generational trauma from kids because they're dealing with a lot of crap that came down from grandparents who were in a depression or in a world war, things like that. So helping them get rid of emotions that don't belong to them, but that they've inherited is really helpful. Your kids need love. They need conversations. They need some form of safety. Maslow's hierarchy of needs has the bottom row of safety and none of us feel the most safe right now. None of us do. And that's okay. We're all trying to make it through this together and we're going to make it because we have each other. I totally agree. And we will make it through together. Compassion, understanding. I think one of the biggest things is that we truly do have to let go of attachment to the outcome of all of this. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have goals or a vision of what our future should look like, but don't base our happiness on whether or not it comes to that. Sarah spoke about generational trauma, carrying emotions that don't belong to you. That is a large part of the work that I do working one-on-one with clients. If you find that you have feelings that you've carried with you your whole life, I would encourage you to reach out, schedule a subconscious blueprint call with me, and we can unpack this and see if we're a fit to work together because she very much mentioned trauma. And while There are a lot of things that we can call trauma. There are some things that are appropriate for a hypnotist like myself. And then there are other things where you really want a licensed counselor who might also practice hypnosis, or you want a hypnotist who will team together with your counselor as you work through an issue, because some things do run very deep and are very traumatic. So if you're interested in finding out if hypnosis can help you and exploring that, I recommend that you do that because time and time and time again, what I see is that when I work with adults and they have children, they come back to me and they tell me how their children have changed as a result of the way their energy changes because we don't recognize how our body language puts out what's going on subconsciously with us, and it can actually make us unapproachable to our children. So we're going to have all of these links in the show notes. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for Sarah for being here. I will see you all next week. Bye now. Thank you for listening today. If you've enjoyed this episode of Design Your Destiny, I would appreciate it if you would head over to iTunes and leave a positive review. When you leave a positive review, it's like podcast currency, and we can increase our reach and get the message to even more people that they, just like you, have the ability to design their destiny. And remember, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform.